I want to invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. I think this will be our last time for a while to explore the Gospel of John. If you haven't been here week to week, we've been working our way through John's account of Jesus' life for several months now. And the plan was to culminate today with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's no surprise to those of you who, uh, who've been part of church in some part of your life, if not throughout your life, to know that this is uh, acknowledged as a high day in the life of the church because of the importance we place on the resurrection. And John's gospel leads us to that and wants to emphasize that to us. I want to read just a few verses. In fact, John's account of the actual resurrection uh, is very brief compared to, to some of the other gospels. And so let's read what he has to say about it, and then uh, we'll say a few things about Jesus' resurrection. So we'll begin with chapter 20 with the very first verse. It says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now I'll stop here and say this. It's John writing this gospel and almost unanimously uh, most scholars believe that it's John who is the other disciple here. In fact, he's called himself the one that Jesus loved or the other disciple. Um, and it's one of the very small places in scripture I think that lends some credibility to it. Every man knows, especially a young man, if two of you ran somewhere and you arrived there first, you would point out that I arrived there first. Is that not a true statement? And so John and Peter both run and it says the other disciple outran Peter. And I love the authenticity and the reality here in the scriptures. Back to the story. Verse 5, he bent over and he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not Go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head, the cloth that was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. May God bless that word for us today. You know, Easter Sunday mornings in churches are always a special event. And like um, our choir music today, it sometimes is carefully planned and wants to be executed to uh, the, the utmost possible. Well, one church was precisely that. The choir had spent much time in preparation and their plan was to sing the hymn that we sang this morning, Christ Arose, and to sing that up from the grave he arose. But they, the choir was going to sing it at the beginning and was going to process from the back to the front. And they had it timed down to the last second of the last note that as the last person in the choir took their place, they would all sing that last line, Hallelujah, Christ Arose. And they practiced and they practiced and the choir director was a stickler for detail and even taught them how, to, how fast to walk and where their markers were and all that. And so the big day came and the organ was playing and the music was ready and the choir began to pr process right on cue. In this particular church, about halfway down the aisle, they had still were using those old air returns in the floor. And as they processed, one of the ladies with her new Easter shoes on had some little tiny heels that wedged right in one of those small squares of that air return. But she didn't want to mess up the timing of that procession. And so when it caught, she just slipped her foot out and just kept right on walking. Well, the man that happened to be behind her saw what happened and he didn't want to mess up the procession either, but he didn't want her to walk on one heel all the rest of the service. And so as he went by, he reached down and grabbed that heel and kept walking. The problem was the whole air return vent came with it. <laughs> so the next person that came along went straight through the floor. <laughs> 
But the person behind him didn't break step, stepped right over that hole and kept right on going. And when the service finished, hallelujah, Christ arose and they were all right in step. But when the music stopped, you could hear faintly from under the floor said, move out of the way, I'm coming up. And one little girl that was sitting closest by said, come on, Jesus, we want to see you. Well, I hope, if nothing else, throughout these months that we've looked at the Gospel of John, but particularly this day and just in this brief passage, is my hope and my prayers for all of us is that we see Jesus. Now, my expectation is this morning He won't come bodily out of the floor from any place, but that He will really be present here with us. And that John's account of a real person who lived a real life, who was really God, would be set before us in such a way that we would see it. Not necessarily with our eyes, but more importantly, with our heart. That we'll have that moment that we have sometimes in life when we say, Oh, I see. And maybe for some of us this morning, for the first time that we see Jesus for who He is and what He's done. It's always been John's intent for this gospel. I've read to you over and over, nearly every Sunday that we've looked at this gospel, if you look a little farther in that same chapter from where we read, right at the end of chapter 20 and verse 31, it says this. John says why he's written all this. Why I write down my eyewitness account? He says, but these things are written, this gospel, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. That's the essence of the gospel. However we share it, whatever our lives look like, whatever words we use to frame the life and death and resurrection of Christ, the goal is always that we believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing that we would have life. John's not just trying to persuade us to believe in some general notion about Jesus that he was a good man or a great teacher or even a prophet, John wants you to believe specifically that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the promised one from all eternity. God's plan was to send one to die for his people. He was prophesied in the Old Testament, and now he wants you to believe that Jesus is in fact that one who had been promised for all those years. He was God in human flesh who came to this earth and it is even at the, the end of this gospel, the pinnacle, the crescendo of John's eyewitness testimony comes in this same chapter. When Thomas, who doubted that Jesus really was resurrected from the dead, when he finally sees and touches Jesus, he proclaims, my Lord and my God. That's the goal of John's gospel. He wants you to do just as Thomas did, to be able to proclaim that Jesus is Lord and that he is God. Now we walked our way through this whole gospel. John has gone to great lengths to convince us by his words here, by this testimony, that he presents evidence to us that Jesus is in fact that one, that God, that son of God. He started from the very first words in this gospel and he said that Jesus was in the beginning, that he was with God and that he was God. And that all things were created through him. But then he reminds us that not everyone who sees believes. Look at verse 9 in chapter 1 and John says, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent or of human decision, but of husband's will. And John goes on to explain all the things that Jesus was and all the things that Jesus did that point to that reality, that it was in fact God himself come to this earth. We read about John uh, uh, was witness to the fact that at Jesus' first miracle was at a wedding. He changed water into wine. 
In the third chapter of John, this man, Nicodemus, who was a religious person, came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, you have to believe on me. Almost all of us know that verse that comes from that chapter. It was in the discussion with that man that Jesus says, whosoever believes in me will have eternal life, that you won't perish. And so as John's gospel goes on, he reminds us that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life because God's wrath remains on him. Jesus met a woman uh, at a well who was steeped in sin, um, who had made a mess of her life. And he says, are you thirsty? And she says, yes, I am thirsty. Give me something to drink. And Jesus says, you need something more than the water from this well. You need something to drink of that you will never be thirsty again. And Jesus says, I am that water. The water I give you will cause you to never be thirsty again. And then he meets a man at a pool who's lame, who can't walk and hasn't walked for years and years and years. And he heals that man. And the religious people of the day want to kill Jesus for it because he did it on the Sabbath day and he claimed that he could forgive sins. And so we began to see in John's testimony that just because Jesus was able to do miraculous things and he taught in a way that people had never seen before, not everyone believed. In fact, some went the other direction. They began to rebel against Jesus. It's ironic that it was the most religious of the people at that time who reacted most violently against who Jesus was. And it says, from that time on, they sought how they might kill Jesus. And Jesus reminds them, if you believed Moses, in other words, if you believe what the Old Testament said was to come, then you would believe in me. He fed 5,000 with bread and fish, and he said, I am the bread of life who comes down out of heaven. He healed a man born blind, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever believes in me will never walk in darkness. He said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And here he begins to be more specific. He says, not only will I lay my life down, but I'll take it up again. Jesus said, yes, I will die for you, but I will be raised again. He raised Lazarus from the dead and he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And he asked his good friend, do you believe this? And she says, I believe you are the Messiah, the son of God who is to come into this world. Shortly thereafter, Jesus comes into Jerusalem for the last time. And people come out. Some of you may have celebrated this in your churches last week if you were there. The triumphal entry, the procession where Jesus comes riding on this colt. And they lay down palm branches in their cloaks and they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They celebrate Jesus as the king. All these things or John's recollection, it's his eyewitness account of who Jesus was and who he is to be understood to be. And ultimately, he wants you and I to know what he says in John chapter 14, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that there's no way to come before God rightly except through Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice this. It is in this passage that they come... And they find that the stone has been rolled away. And Peter Marshall, if you know his name, pointed out something that's very interesting to me. Why was the stone rolled away? Did that stone have to be moved in order for Jesus to be raised from the dead? Did that stone have to be moved in order for Jesus to get out of that tomb? I don't think so. The stone, Peter Marshall says, was rolled away from the door not to permit Christ to come out, but to enable the disciples to go in. That God knew that these people, even though they had spent a number of years walking and talking and listening to the teachings of Jesus, that they needed to see something on that day. And in fact, um, the word see or saw or looked or beheld, whatever your version might say, is several times just in those short verses. Notice how different seeing can be. 
The resurrection of Christ seemed to be a surprise to these disciples. The people that say that Jesus' resurrection was a hoax perpetrated by Jesus' own disciples haven't read this account. They were surprised that Jesus wasn't there. In fact, it says that when they got there, John arrived first and he looked or he saw into the tomb and he saw the, the burial cloths laying there without Jesus' body in them and nothing else. It just says that he looked and he stopped and he didn't go in. And if you know much about Peter, he's the impetuous disciple. He blows right past John, even though he's beaten him there, and he goes right into the tomb. And it says that Peter also saw, but it's a different word for saw. The first word is just a passing glimpse. This word for saw in, in Greek is a, is a quick glance or a simple Look, but now Peter's look is more carefully and observably uh, 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 or intensely observing what's there. He looks more closely, but there's still no reaction from Peter. But the kind of see, the kind of uh, word for saw here that we really want to get at is the last one when John, verse 8, finally goes down into that tomb. And it says that he looked upon those things. And your version may use this word. He beheld the linen wrappings. This is a Greek word that has to do with to carefully observe or intensely comprehend. Um, in fact, the, the, the closest translation is piercing. It is that it gets to the root of all of this. And for the first time, even having seen all that Jesus had done and all that he said, it says that John saw and he believed. That's the kind of seeing that we have to have when we are confronted with Christ. And it is that in John's gospel and here at the resurrection, we get to see those kinds of things. The resurrection is a powerful message because it tells us that God has in fact accepted the payment of Jesus on the cross for our sins. And now he's not just accepted that payment, now he's provided new life for us. And one key to that is this. One of the last things we read there, in fact, in your Bible, it's probably a parenthetical statement. Verse 9, the whole verse in, my, in the NIV is a parenthesis. It says, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. His own disciples had not yet comprehended fully what the resurrection meant and it's necessity. So I would ask you that question this morning. Why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? Couldn't his death have just been sufficient payment for the penalty of sin and it could have been that's that? It couldn't have been that way. Why did he have to rise from the dead? Well, there's several simple things. First of all, it's because the Bible had always said that he would rise from the dead and Jesus himself said he would rise from the dead. If he didn't, rise from the dead. He's a liar. And so is the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, the very first sermon that was preached after Jesus' death by Peter, one of his disciples, he reminds us that in Psalm 16, it says that the Messiah, who he claims Jesus to be, would in fact rise from the dead. And it's all these years later that John recalls those things. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, many places in the Old Testament, it says that this one who's promised to come and save his people would in fact die and he would rise from the dead. But more importantly, Jesus himself said that he would. Not long before these events take place, Jesus was standing before the temple and he said, tear this down and in three days I will build it up again. And John in this gospel tells us he was speaking not of the temple building, but of Jesus' own body. He says that, uh, that he, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and that they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Many times, not only in the Old Testament scriptures, but Jesus himself had said, um, I will lay down my life, but I will take it up again. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And the last thing, in more than one place in the scriptures, 
the summary is given of what Jesus taught his disciples. It says something like this. Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, that he must suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and that he will be killed and that he will be raised on the third day. All those things remind us that Jesus had to be risen from the dead. If he wasn't, the scriptures were a lie and he was a liar. The scriptures also tell us that if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead, he had to be raised from the dead. Because if not, then our faith is in vain. Just believing in one who was willing to sacrifice himself on our behalf um, is touching. It might be important to know that someone loved us that much, but the fact that he was raised from the dead is where our faith really lies, is that Jesus is who he says he did, is, and that by being raised from the dead, we know that he is from God, that he himself, in fact, is God. And so without that, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that our faith is dead, it's in vain, and we are still in our sins if Christ has not been raised from the dead. And that passage that we read in our responsive reading is why it says, but Christ is indeed raised from the dead. It's also important that Jesus be raised from the dead to demonstrate the power of God for salvation. Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter 1 when he says, Concerning his son who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness. From the time of Jesus till now, preachers all over the earth, everywhere and every place and every time have proclaimed that the power of God is demonstrated by a risen Savior. No other religion on the face of this earth ever has made that same claim, that their savior, their prophet, their teacher was in fact dead and now lives. It's unique to Christianity. It's the demonstration of the power of God. And finally, it's this. It's proof of the authority and the promise for the future. Now, let me say this very clear. I want to read to you what the scripture says. And if you don't heard anything else that have said this morning, we need to be reminded of this. In Acts chapter 17, again, when the Apostle Paul is preaching, he says this, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The scriptures tell us this morning that as sure as the sun will set tonight and rise in the morning, that God has fixed a day when Jesus will come again in power and each and every man, woman, and child will stand in judgment before him. And Paul says that the resurrection is proof of the authority of Jesus Christ as the one who will judge us. And the question this morning then is what? Is there life after this? Do we die and then everything goes black and there's nothing more? Or is the Bible correct when it says he's fixed a day in which all those who have already gone on will be raised from the dead and all those still living will stand before God. And it is Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior, who will judge us according to life on this earth. And then the question is, am I good enough? Have I lived a life that's acceptable before God? Has everything I've ever done, thought, said, or been acceptable in God's eyes? And if it's not, then what? And the answer is not what, but who? It is Jesus Christ who stands with us. Not only is he our judge, but he's our savior. It is he himself who has paid the penalty for those sins. And so that day that has been fixed in eternity, since eternity, we look forward to that day and we say, have I seen Jesus? Have I apprehended him? Have I comprehended him? Have I taken hold of who Jesus is? And it's interesting to me that multitudes of people, according to John's eyewitness account, saw Jesus. Throughout his whole life, people saw Jesus every day. But many never had their eyes open to the reality of who Jesus really was. So my question to you this morning is, do you see Jesus? Do you see Jesus as 
the suffering Savior and the risen Lord. First Peter says, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life. And we have everything to live for, including future in heaven. And that future can start now. New life is, in, is every man, woman's, and, and child's greatest need. And I'll close with this story. Max Lucado, who some of you know, I, I really enjoy reading the many books that he's written, tells this story. He went out to start his car one day and he turned on the ignition and nothing. Some of you have had that experience. And this is what he says. So I did what anyone else would do. I doused my car with a fifth of whiskey, confident that a bottle of 80 proof would stir some life in it. Nothing happened. Then I rolled a television in front of the grill and flipped the game on. A good contest perks up even the deadest cell, right? Not this time. So I purchased the latest issue of Hot Rod magazine and let the automobile feast upon the latest European models. No response. The battery had the punch of a shoebox, he says. And you think I'd have the, I, the IQ of a screwdriver, but when we ask the question, who turns to booze, screens, or bodies for the renewal of life? You know the answer is many do. Too many do. In fact, uh, another person of renown said one time that every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is seeking after God. You know, it's a true statement that in the absence of a Savior, in the absence of seeing Jesus for really, who He really is, we'll knock on any old door and we'll try any old thing to fill that void that's within us. And since that first Easter morning, Billions of people have turned their eyes from the things of this earth, those kinds of things, and have looked to the Savior for eternal life. How do we explain that? You've heard this before. Jesus was only a backwater peasant. He never wrote a book, never held an office, never journeyed more than 200 miles from his hometown. Friends left him. One betrayed him. Those he helped forgot him. Prior to his death, they abandoned him. But after his death, they couldn't resist him. What made the difference? His death and his resurrection. For when he died, your sin died. And when he rose, your hope rose. When he rose from the grave, your grave was changed from a final residence to a temporary housing. That's the good news of the gospel. And on that first Easter morning, when John stood in that tomb, it was there that he began to first understand who Jesus was and why he came to this earth. As he considered the life that Jesus lived and the things that Jesus taught, his eyes were open to the reality of who Jesus was. And John himself says, I saw and I believed. My prayer for us this morning is we would truly see Jesus for who he is. Go back and read John's gospel. You can do it in one sitting without too much trouble. See who John says he is. He says, this is what I've seen with my own eyes. In fact, the end of this book says, if I were to write all the things down, it would fill many rooms. But these are the things I want you to know, that Jesus is in fact the Christ. And by believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of sinners, we may have life, eternal life. That's his promise to us today. Can we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you particularly for your word this morning, for the testimony of John and all the many since his time that have come to testify to new life in Christ. And so I pray this morning that we would give ourselves more fully to you because of it, that our eyes and our hearts would be opened to see Christ as our Lord and our Savior, that we could leave this place saying, I have seen